All right, folks, this is Harris Sultan, and I am back with another special episode. And today I've got my favorite scientist, well, at least, well, uh, or, or at least the fields of sciences, which I have always been fascinated about. And some people, instead of arguing my arguments, they said, why, is he, why does Harris keep bringing up T-Rex in his book? I think I believe I, I mentioned it six times, which also happened to be its weight. Uh, that's a cool co uh, fun fact. So I've got Dr. Susanna Maidman with me. And um, Susanna Maidman is a paleontologist at the Natural History Museum of London, which I missed it by that much when I was in London. And I'm, you know, ever since then, I'm, I'm not really happy. But anyway, I'll be, I'll be back soon once this, the whole pandemic and everything's gone. Susie, how are you doing? Hi there. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I'm very good. How, how are you coping with um, with the whole pandemic and everything? Uh, Does that affect your I'm work? So, and... Yeah, I'm so over it now. I, yeah, I've had four research trips cancelled to the States and Morocco. I was supposed to be going to look for dinosaurs in Morocco in March and um, stuff in Utah and Montana as well. And it's all been cancelled. And instead I'm stuck in my attic in Sussex in the south coast of the UK. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Not so and, much and, time, no. and winter is about to start as well, so that definitely not the best time to be in England. No, it's it's just miserable. It's just going to rain for the next six months, basically. So yeah. Right. So tell me. So yeah, you, th th this is something that always fascinates me about scientists who dedicate a big part of their lives in in a certain discipline, and you know, basically half their lives they spend in learning that. And uh, so tell me a little bit about your journey. What made you interested in dinosaurs? I mean, I, I'm 36 years old and I still can't get over the coolness of dinosaurs. And some people tease me like, come on, man. We, we also like dinosaurs when we were kids, but you still talk about them as if, you know, like it's the most important thing. So tell me a little bit about you. At least I can step away from it. But you're, 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 you're active in a field that a lot of people also say that it's, how does that benefit humanity? We, we, we'll get to that first. But tell me a little bit about you, that how you got into it. Okay, well, um, this sounds like a story that's made up, but I promise you it's not. It is the truth. Um, when I was about six or seven, um, my grandpa, who was an electrical engineer, he's a very clever man, um, you know, very knowledgeable and well, and um, uh, you know, he, he, he scientist really, engineer. Um, he said to me, "What are you going to be when you grow up?" Um, and I said, well, um, you know, at the time I was, you know, I was six. So I was I was thinking that I might be a princess. Um, but um, I also I thought scientists seemed quite cool because, you know, like lab coats and pouring like colored liquid from one thing to another and causing explosions and stuff like that. This is what I had in my mind as scientist. And um, obviously he was quite keen to um, to sort of move me away from the princess idea. So he says, well, I think scientist is an excellent idea. What sort of scientist? And I didn't know that there were different sorts of scientists. So I said, uh, so I said this and he said, well, how about being a dinosaur scientist? Because I, you know, I'm six, I love dinosaurs. I had a blow up stegosaurus and a stegosaurus money box. Uh, so I said, yeah, that sounds fine. Uh, so that's what I did, basically. Um, I did, in the UK, there's uh, uh, a World Heritage site on the south coast of the UK um, called the, um, the Jurassic Coast. And there's lots and lots of marine uh, reptiles that are found there, lots of uh, fossils of um, invertebrates, things like ammonites and sort of curly fossils. Um, and I spent lots of my childhood holidays there as well, um, digging up fossils and finding those fossils on the beach as well. So I spent, you know, I spent a lot of time engaging with fossils as a child too. So I think both of those things were um, kind of instrumental in what I decided to do. But yeah, I mean, it, it made kind of all those decisions that you have to make at school about which subjects you're going to study and what you're going to do when you go to university it made them all very easy for me because I decided when I was six what I was going to do. But but it's quite amazing that, you know, and, and, I mean, I remember that, that that's the most common question everyone asks you. Like, what are you going to, what are you going to do when you grow up? And my question, my answer was always different every year. <laughs> you know, yeah. it just depended. But, but it's quite another thing. And this is what, you know, like I hear all the famous scientists and they talk about it. They say, you know, I was a kid, I was just looking up in the night sky and I was like, now nah, I've got to learn more about it. And then 40 or 30 years later, you know, they're still doing their PhD in that. And you're like, wow, that is some conviction. <laughs> so you deciding that at six years of age and then actually carrying on with it, that is, 
that is quite something. How, how would what would you tell people? Um, because a lot of my audience, a lot of my audience are under twenty five, between fifteen to twenty five. What would you tell them? Because people struggle these days, especially. The, what are we going to do? And then there's family pressure, and then you're like, okay, yeah. you, you, you're going to be something. How do you stick to something, and how do you discover that this is what I want to do? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I feel incredibly privileged that my parents are very supportive of of my career choice, which might not, um, you know, have obviously immediately led to say lots of money and things like that. Um, you know, my family were very supportive of me kind of following my dream. Um, you know, I the thing. I guess my top tip, my, my kind of philosophy um, has always been that as long as you, as long as I try my best at everything, I do my absolute best that I can possibly do, then I can never look back and go, you know, I really wish I'd stuck with that. Or I really wish I'd done, like I'd done better at that or try harder. If you always kind of try the hardest you possibly can, then even if you don't succeed, at least you can look back kind of without any regret that you haven't succeeded because you did the best you could. So I don't know, that's kind of my philosophy on life. Right. All right. So now let's get into it. Now, first thing I want to I want to ask some question that usually exists in a lot of people's minds. We first of all, the most common question a lot of skeptics ask is like, how do these scientists know how old a certain bone is? And obviously, first of all, so these are not bones and these are um, the fossils. And tell us a little bit about what the What's the difference between a bone and a fossil? And how do you scientists actually work out that this is 500 million years old? Because the moment we go beyond 10, 15,000 years, our minds, we start, we, yeah. we can't work it out. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what fossils are, fossil, what fossilized bones are, is if you can picture a bone and, and, and the insides of the bone, there are pore spaces um, within that structure. So it's, it's, it's got little spaces in between the minerals that make up the bone. Um, and also, if you think of like the, the middle of long bones, they kind of have a spongy texture and stuff like that. And as when these these things are, are buried um, under sediments and under rocks, and, and and as the rock, as the sediment, the soil, and 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 you know, sand, whatever turns into rock, what happens is fluid is moving through the rock and precipitating minerals as it goes. And those minerals change the 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 sediment from sediment into rock. And the same thing happens with the bone. So the bone gets minerals precipitated um, in all of its pore spaces. And so it either, depending on how the fossilization occurs, sometimes we have some of the original bone chemistry left. And sometimes that bone chemistry is entirely changed and replaced by different minerals. Um, so what, we're in, what we end up with is effectively something that is quite similar to rock. Um, how we date it, well, we can't date bone directly. Uh, longer, more, uh, longer than about 36,000, 40,000 years, something like that, we can't directly date the bone itself. So if we're looking at things like dinosaurs, we, we have to date the rocks around that. Um, and the way that we do that is using a technique called radiometric dating. So this is based on um, the principle that um, when a volcano erupts, and um, what was once liquid, the magma, begins to solidify and particles of ash might fall out, um, the some of those minerals that precipitate from that are have radioactive elements in them. And those radioactive elements we know decay at a constant rate. And this means that um, we can use the amount of one element to the one that it decays to, like a ratio to, we can kind of use it like a stop clock. So the stop clock starts the second the volcano erupts. And when we analyze how much of one mineral there is versus another mineral, then that's kind of the end point. So um, depending on how old you're looking at, you use different minerals. But what we try and do when we're doing when we're looking at dinosaur fossils is because dinosaur fossils aren't usually buried by volcanic eruptions or rarely, um, we have to find kind of volcanic layers that are maybe lying above or below our fossils or close to our fossils. And then we can kind of constrain the ages based on that. Um, but that's how the age of the Earth has been dated, um, and that's how we date specific layers. So it's using this radiometric dating. And I believe um, I was watching a documentary a while ago. Some of the oldest rocks were found in Australia, and that's how they kind of worked out how old the continent of Australia is. Oh, well, the age of Earth was actually uh, estimated to be four billion years old because we have um, some rocks that are four billion years old uh, in the outback. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So the the continents that the actual kind of continental areas, the continental crust of the Earth, which forms the cores of the continents today, 
uh, has been around since the since well pretty early on in, in the formation of the earth um, as you say about four four billion years and so areas of Canada and areas of Australia um, and also I think Greenland preserve some of the oldest rocks on earth the oldest continental crust on earth and that's exactly how they've dated that yeah right so with simple life a lot of people say a lot of scientists say that life originated on planet earth quite early on in its formation mm -hmm. now i'm assuming those would have been very simple unicellular organisms how do we find out about them because obviously they didn't leave any bones or fossils so how, how yeah. does that how do we work out the age of life on earth yeah so that's a really tricky problem and something that people have um, you know, spent a long time puzzling over because there are some fossils, there are some things and some of these very, very, oh, I've just lost you a second. Bear with me while my computer's logged me out. Hang on. I can still hear you. You can still hear me. Great. I'm back. I can still see you fine. Remember. Yep. Right. Um, the, um, yeah. So um, there are some really old fossils. And if you look in some of these really, really old rocks on places like Greenland, Canada and Australia, you there are actually some structures in those rocks that um, do uh, appear to look organic and they might be cells and, and cells join together. But people have debated for a really long time whether these things really are fossils uh, and evidence of life or whether they are abiotic structures. So just, just generated through mineral growth or precipitation of minerals and nothing to do with life at all. And that's really tricky. So what people have done instead is start to look at the chemistry of the rocks to try to identify the chemical signatures of life. So life has fundamentally changed the surface of the Earth. Um, when the Earth first formed, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. And we have oxygen in the atmosphere because plants exhale oxygen, you know, and during photosynthesis, they give out oxygen. And that's why our, our atmosphere is oxygenated. So just the fact that we have life on Earth has fundamentally changed the chemistry of the surface of the Earth. And so people can use those chemical signatures of life to try to figure out when those you know, when we first see those in the fossil record. And we know that the, ox the, the atmosphere began to oxygenate um, or, or sort of there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere by about two billion years ago. Um, and we know this because of rocks. What we start to see is that we actually start to see iron minerals in rocks rusting effectively at that time. So of course we don't, when there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, that we would have iron that wasn't going rusty. But we all know that iron rusts in oxygen, right? So uh, when we start to see the iron minerals in rocks being oxidized or rusting, then right. um, that's the indication, that's a big indication that there was a lot of life on Earth. So we definitely know that life was around by 2 billion years. But there are fossils that are substantially older that people do debate about. Um, but it does look like there was probably life about 3.5 billion years, something like that. Right, we, which is with still a long, long period of time, but very early on in terms of obviously um, how, we, how we've how we been told that how hostile the early planet was. There was early bombardment, late bombardment. I, I can just imagine. By the way, did you watch the show Primeval? Yeah, I totally did. Oh, my God. I love that <laughs> I'm a massive fan, and I keep talking about it. And nobody knows about it. Even some I, of the, I've never met anybody who liked that show. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, yeah it's no, the two fans, here we are. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it too at the end if you have time. Um, so you know, like how you imagine how prehistoric Earth would have been. Uh, there were molten, molten rocks and flying everywhere. You know, like it, it, there would be no solid surface to stand on, and that's why people actually struggle to grasp that. Okay, how could life? How do you um, buy the buy look 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 at the idea that what's it called panspermia? Like the life might have originated somewhere else and then it came. I My head can't grasp that an asteroid or a meteor can actually cause so much devastation. How could anything survive at, at, upon entry and then the impact? How, how is that viewed in the scientific community? Is the panspermia, is, is it actually a very acceptable theory or not? Yeah, I mean, it's not my area of expertise. Um, but, you know, I, I think that um, most scientists consider that Earth, that life started on Earth. Um, I think that it it's possibly um, accepted, maybe that's unfair, it's fair to say that, that the ingredients, some of the ingredients for life, um, like some of the maybe Earth proteins might have arrived on Earth from uh, meteors and things like that. But I don't think it's widely accepted that life started uh, outside right. of Earth. I, I right. think that's fair to say. But as I say, it isn't my area of expertise. Fair, fair enough. Now, 
um, one of the other the other biggest um, anomalies borrowed from Primeval that we have is um, how, how what happened at the what we call Cambrian explosion. What happened there for like nearly two billion or one and a half billion years? We have these unicellular organisms just doing nothing. There was a bacteria. What's that bacteria called? That is also believed to have produced so much oxygen in the environment. We've been we've, that's been going on for so long, and then all of a sudden, Cambrian explosion happens. What, what, what's that snaily looking like uh, creature that we find one of the oldest fossil? And uh, ha what happened? What, what, what's the what's the scientific view of that? Yeah. I, again, I you know. It's, it's not it's not my, my the area that I study uh, most of the time, but um, I think I don't think we know the answer either. Um, there, at, around the same time, um, uh, we start to see um, just before the Cambrian explosion. There's a, a groups of animals called the Ediacara fauna, and these are yeah. this is multicellular but soft soft bodied life, and it's seen all around the world um, at this time. And this also um, seems to coincide with. Um, a series of um, almost global glaciations, which have kind of been nicknamed the snowball glaciations. But this is when yeah. the Earth was almost entirely covered in ice. And that, there was big, so there was big climatic perturbations going on, um, probably very large changes to um, ocean chemistry and things like that. And what we see at the Cambrian explosion, which is about 541 million years ago, was, is that we suddenly start to see hard parts in the fossil record. So rather than just seeing soft squidgy things, we actually start to see animals with shells um, and hard parts which preserve much better in the fossil record. And so it's, it's not, I mean, I don't know really whether it's clear yet that this really was truly an explosion, whether it's, it's just that we suddenly get a lot of fossils preserved but we didn't get the soft parts preserved before. There's probably a bit of both. Um, but maybe it was something to do with ocean chemistry um, coming out of the snowball. I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know what, what right. caused the Cambrian explosion, but, um, you know, th there was cl massive climatic perturbations at that time that were going on. With, with also the other puzzling thing is with, the, the, with Cambrian explosion and, because, you know, these words are so catchy, explosion and the Big Bang and, you know, that, that just throws people off. Explosion, I'm, I'm assuming, so that early complicated, for, um, as you said, endoskeleton organisms, etc., how long was that period? I mean, the, the boundary of that, is that 100 million years or something? In that case, if it's 100 million, even 10 million years, it's not really an explosion. Like, it's, we can't explain where the life just came from. Um, if it's taking 100 million years, that's a considerable amount of time for evolution to take place. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, it would have been on that sort of time scale. We don't have, I mean, yeah. Uh, right. We don't have the resolution or the dating of the fossil record to be able to pin it down to, you know, what happened over a sort of thirty-year period, you know, and it, and it didn't. It, you know, this is this is a massive evolutionary event, and when we're talking about big evolutionary events, you know, we say explosion, but yeah, yeah, this is what we're talking about is a massive increase in diversity. But this would have happened over over many many millions of years, so it's not an instantaneous event in, in only, yeah, in right. either geologic terms or real terms. Right. Now, after that, the other big event that happened was a, was called a Permian extinction. And uh, our favorite Gorgonopsids were running around at that time. What, what That's the biggest. People usually think that uh, the KT event is the biggest um, uh, extinction event, but it's actually Permian. What, what, what's the number? Like 95% of all life yeah. went extinct or something? So yeah, how... how and, yeah, go on. It's, 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 you know, it's incredibly difficult, actually, to, to directly measure what went extinct and how, how, what proportion of life went extinct. And that it's still controversial. But the evidence suggests that both in the marine realm, within the sea, um, probably 90 to 95 percent of life. And, and on land, it's a little more, bit more difficult. But people have, have estimated somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of life on Earth as well. Um, and yeah, that at this time, there were enormous volcanic eruptions. Um, probably the largest volcanic eruptions ever to have affected the planet. They're, they're preserved today in huge lava piles called um, the Sib Siberian Traps, which are preserved over much of northern Russia. Huge, just, you know, like mind-blowingly enormous, things that we can't even imagine. And this fundamentally changed the climate. Um, and this uh, was what was probably the cause of, of all of this extinction that happened. Now, to contrast that with the KT extinction, which is the one that killed the dinosaurs, we think there may be only 60 to 65% of species went extinct. 
So at the end of the Permian, I mean, it, it's no exaggeration to say that life nearly ended. You know, it, literally, um, life nearly went extinct. Right. So what happened then? And I obviously dinosaurs would not have come into existence had that not happened. So that was, uh, what do they call them? They're half reptiles, half amphibians? Or no, half reptiles, half mammalian? Or no, so there's what? the mammal-like reptiles, yeah, that's right. Yeah, mammal-like reptiles, that's it. So um, there, there was a very famous one that was kind of like dog-like, but it had a big snout. I forgot what it's called. Um, uh, so so that was kind of like a early kind of a prototype. And then what happened? That one branch of reptiles went into dinosaurs um and then that happened in late triassic period which is what 220 million years ago or two, yeah yeah two, that's right. right so after i mean before the Permian extinction the the, the mammal-like reptiles were um uh these are basically our ancestors the early mammals um, and they weren't true mammals at this time you know they were much more reptilian in the way that they looked but they were the lineage that led on to us and they were very diverse um, and they were really, they really dominated terrestrial ecosystems. So they're really like the, most of the animals that live on land and boats. Um, and then, yeah, at the end of the Permian, they never really recovered um, to quite the same extent. Um, and through most of the Mesozoic, which is the following period, um, what you see is that the mammals are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're much smaller. So what happened was at the end of the period, at the end of the Permian, we seem to have this kind of decrease of the mammal-like reptiles. And then we see that an increase in the archosaurs and the archosaurs are today represented by the birds and the, the, the crocodiles. Uh, but back then were represented by the dinosaurs and the crocodile, the lineage that, that leads to modern day crocodiles. Um, and again, the, the, the crocodilian type lineage was very, very, was quite diverse um, at, at that, during the Triassic. And then we see another extinction event um, and maybe maybe more than one and maybe spread out over some time, it's hard to nail down, where um, actually then the crocodiles, the crocodilomorphs don't do so well uh, and the dinosaurs start to take over. But yeah, the first dinosaurs, I mean, the earliest dinosaur, putative dinosaur that we have is about 240 million years ago. Um, and then as we move into the Jurassic, which is about 200 million years ago, then we see the dinosaurs really take off. And during that Jurassic and, tri and uh, Cretaceous period, there was really no big, there were no mammals really bigger than kind of a, a large cat or a badger or something like that. So um, the mammals were really a small kind of minor part of ecosystems during the Mesozoic and the dinosaurs really um, took off and took the opportunity to kind of radiate into this kind of vacant space that had been created by these other animals going extinct in these two big extinction events. Um, so, okay, but Crocodiles are said to be one of the oldest uh, living animals at the moment. And you said that, the, did you did you say that there were a few more extinction events during the Mesozoic era or, uh, because we see it's such a long period of time that dinosaur populations go up and down as well. And there's so many other theories as well. Um, some people already postulate that um, by the time KT event happened, dinosaurs were already on their way out or something. But one thing that always puzzles me with crocodiles being living fossils, they've remained throughout and so many other marine reptiles went into extinction. Um, but how come crocodiles survive? And one of my favorite ones, Sacrosuchus, was in there as well at some point. So, I mean, yeah, I think firstly, this idea that crocodiles are kind of living fossils and unchanged since dinosaurs is, is just, it, that's just a misunderstanding of, of, right. of and it, it's often said, but it's just not true. I mean, the, croc the, cro the crocodilian lineage existed back then, uh, but they were actually very, very diverse. Um, there were a lot of terrestrial forms, so ones that were probably had quite long, slender legs, were quite um, they're able to run. Um, they lived much, much more on land. Uh, they've sort of secondarily gone back into the water in our, you know, today's modern lineages. But the crocodiles, the crocodilians, and the crocodilomorphs back then were much more diverse. We had marine crocs living in the oceans, um, and you know, today's crocs are just a remnant. Um, of that past diversity, but also the species that are alive today are not the species that were alive back then. And you know, in the same way that the birds that are alive today aren't the same as the dinosaurs that were alive in the Mesozoic. Um, but, but the yeah, fossils because... that we find, but the fossil, I, I, and I guess that's probably where the thought comes from, the fossils that we find is the same si type of a structure, you know, like it's a long lizard-like body, it has four legs and then, you know, sometimes coming out. So that's what, for an amateur, that, that's probably where it convinces them. Yeah, but not always. I mean, there's 
as I say, there were long, slender limbed types, and there were types of kind of like snub noses that were, you know, almost dog like. Um, there, there's, there was plenty of diversity out there in the crocs, and and things that we think of as a croc today, like an alligator or, or a crocodile, they, you know, we don't really see that that type of crocodile come until much later. Um, so right. back then in the, Perm in the Triassic, that's yeah, that we don't really have crocs like that. We have we have we do have long things with long thin snouts, a bit like gharials. Um, but they're not, they're, they're, they're phytosaurs, they're, you know, they're other, other, um, groups that aren't directly related to today's ones. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, they, people always say this and I, I just think it's a little bit of a misunderstanding of the croc record. I think it's been, um, uh, I think it's been a bit undersold that like crocs haven't changed for, for 200 million years. It's just not true. It does, does a massive disservice to the amazing past diversity of crocs, but, um, yeah, well, why they got through the end Cretaceous extinction when the dinosaurs died and, and lots of other marine reptiles, as you said, things like the ichthyosaurs died. Um, lots of uh, lots of the crocs did go extinct then, but they, not all of them. And, and why? I don't think we know the answer to that question. Um, it's possible that uh, the crocs that survived there, they're, they're, they're feeding, they're what's known as detritivores, which means they often feed off kind of dead stuff and leftover stuff. Um, so it might have been possible that actually the, the mass extinction suited them quite well because there's lots of dead stuff around. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to answer, and I don't think that, that science has satisfactorily addressed that question, really. Right, and this is why I think I'm, I'm going to reserve the last 10 minutes just on the extinction event because there's so many cool documentaries and, you know, like the poor dinosaurs just running for their lives and the T-Rex is being blown away by this massive shockwave so we'll get to that so now let's get into the jurassic era and i think this is what called the golden age of dinosaurs and that's when continents started drifting halfway through jurassic period or something and so we have isolated dinosaurs um in australia and uh, obviously eurasia and africa was the big area but actually you know north america we find more fossils in north america than anywhere else which is which oh, okay so that one what happened there now is that because they have beaten all the other competition and now we're seeing these massive sauropods these long-necked dinosaurs it's like I, I still think it's one of the most iconic images when dr alan grant grabs um uh, ali's head and he's like whoa look at that and it's like wow i i watched that movie when i was nine years old in the cinema that was my first movie and i was like wow I wish I had become a, decided to become a paleontologist then. <laughs> I think I think lots of people became paleontologists because of that movie. I was mm. twelve, so yeah. R right. So so ha so how what's so special about that? That why do we have the biggest diversity of dinosaurs at that time? It, yeah. So I think there's I think there's a couple of different things at play here. I think you're right that we've got um, uh, lots of dinosaur lineages have be have become established and they are. Um, speciating and all, all continents of the earth. We find dinosaurs all over the earth. Um, but also remember that if we're looking at a fossil record from say 300 million years ago, 200, 200, even 250 million years ago versus 150 million years, that's like a hundred million years less time for those fossils to have been destroyed by erosion, to have been crushed by tectonics. So the nearer we get to today to the recent, the easier it is to find fossils. And so fossils of the, the, the dinosaurs that lived in the Triassic and the crocs and the, and, and, and the mammal-like reptiles that are alive in the Triassic, they were already fossils by the time that things like Diplodocus lived. So we just it's just easier for, for us to find fossils because they just haven't been dead as long. So to some extent, it's just that then, you know, they're, they're better preserved. So there's probably an, an element of sampling there, which is that they're more easy for us to find. Now, there's another sure. element of sampling, which is that they're massive, some of them. So things like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus, they're huge. So it's they're easy to spot. They don't get smashed up necessarily during the fossilization process. So there's probably a little bit of that going on as well. But you're probably right. There is also probably kind of some speciation going on as well related to kind of break up the continents and stuff. And what is the theory on the fact that all these sauropods went extinct by the time Cretaceous era happened. However, in one continent, South America, they survived. And um, and we had this battle between Argentinosaurus and Giganotosaurus was going on. 
Whereas everywhere else, all the sauropods were gone and they were replaced by duck-billed dinosaurs. Yeah, so again, I think um, we have to be really careful because I think our view of the fossil record and how evolution proceeded is very heavily biased by the North American fossil record. And that's because people have been looking for dinosaurs in North America for 150 years. They've been intensively sampled. And, and I know this is going to be my answer to, to some of your questions later about why we don't find dinosaurs in certain places as well. And, you know, it's probably just that we haven't been looking as hard um, or for as long. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that it, certainly in North America, there's very good evidence that the sauropods went extinct at the end of, well, at the end of the Jurassic or just after the end of the Jurassic period. And we don't see them back in North America again until we get to the very end of the Cretaceous. And at this time, they probably, they're probably migrants, uh, maybe coming up from, the, from South America or, or, or maybe from other parts of the world, I'm not sure. But All right. it, it seems like the Southern Hemisphere, there were plenty of sauropods in the Cretaceous. Um, and actually, they were probably the dominant um, herbivores. Um, and, and South America is somewhere, again, where... Um, you know, not for such a long period of time, but certainly for maybe 50 years, people have been looking hard for fossils. And, and you know, particularly Argentina um, is, is now very well explored. Um, and there's lots of groups working there. So we have got a good fossil record from Argentina. And, and it is showing us that there are different, you know, there's different, the North American record might not be true of everywhere. There might have been different um, stories going on in different places. Right. So let's talk about North America the bias then. Obviously, North America with Hollywood and more effort into dinosaurs being, I don't know, having all this kind of resources. Now they started our fascination with dinosaurs and when it comes to dinosaurs, who doesn't like T-Rex? Right. So, so don't like you don't? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come yeah, on. You don't like baryonyx. T-Rex is the most overexposed dinosaur. I was um, just yeah. going to say, it's see the, this is where the Britain versus America coming in. But, you know, this is why we like T-Rex because it's still to this day the main, it's not the biggest dinosaur, biggest carnivorous dinosaur, but to this day the fascination is just like the big jaw. I even see T-Rex in my little dog sometimes. But I don't it. It's, it, it's just a fascination with that. What? Why do we have, again, Is that does that have to do with America? And I think it's equivalent in, China or Mongolia is Tarbosaurus, which is slightly smaller than T-Rex. How cool is T-Rex? So tell me, tell me, tell me about what we know about T-Rex. What's um, and I think it only lived for like two million years out of what 160 yeah. million years of dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so, so tell us something about T-Rex. It's my favorite. Yeah, I, well, <laughs> I mean, you know, T I think T-Rex is is overexposed, but you know, there right. is no doubt that it has captured generations of um, our attention, hasn't it? Really. Um, it was without doubt a fearsome uh, predator. So, you know, it had a, a very, very good sense of smell. We can tell that from looking at the brain and the shapes of parts of the brain, which is preserved inside a brain case. So we haven't got the soft tissues, but we've got the brain case, which is the bony structure. So we as mammals, we just kind of have this, this, this our brain is just in our skull, but reptiles have a separate brain case, which really faithfully preserves the shape of different structures so things like um the, the bulbs of the brain which relate to smell to sight so we can we can look at those and say yeah how you know what were the what were the abilities of this dinosaur like and so it was clearly um it had binocular vision so it had um uh, its eyes overlapped so it was able to see in 3d uh, it could see a really probably quite a long distance um so very very sharp vision um excellent sense of smell um we haven't measured the bite force of every animal that ever lived of course um, but for the animals that we have measured, bite forces, T-Rex had, it appears, the strongest bite force of any animal. So um, its ability to bite you was certainly um, very large. Um, so it was definitely, definitely a fearsome predator. And, you know, I think it probably was everything that your nightmares might suggest it, it would have been. Um, oh, so yes, I want to be chased by a T-Rex. <laughs> now, oh, but that's what... Not exactly. Well, yeah, so I've seen I've seen the conflicting uh, information. Some people say it could maintain a decent pace, which is an Olympic runner or something, equivalent of that. Uh, but then I've seen some places where it's like slow and lumbering, and then the heavy head and the heavy tail. Mm -hmm. That in that meant that it couldn't really sh change directions very quickly. So I mean, if we're running in front of it, just take a sharp ride, and it could actually trip, and it could actually break a bone, which obviously 
it won't. So it would just let you run away. Yeah, what do we know about his locomotion? Yeah, you can imagine that uh, actually trying to calculate running speeds in dinosaurs, although <clears throat> although they're often bandied about, you know, this one could run this fast. Actually calculating that is, is really hard. Um, and the way that it's been done, um, the most sort of uh, scientific or technologically advanced way that it's been done, um, was done by um, a couple of my colleagues at Manchester and Liverpool fairly recently. And they um, built a, an evolutionary robotic model. So this is a computational model, it's not a real robot. Right. Um, to look at how fast T-Rex could run. Um, and they, they applied all sorts of forces and, and rules around the bones that we know exist. Like they told it that gravity existed and things like that. And then right. what they do is they set off this evolutionary robotic model and they say, learn to move. Um, and because it's an evolutionary learning algorithm, it tries one thing, like maybe it like hops and then it falls over and then it goes, okay, that doesn't work. And so it, and they right. have a massive supercomputer to do these calculations. Right. And what they figured out from doing all this was that, um, was that T-Rex, it couldn't run. So it, it couldn't, so running is when you have both feet off the ground at the same time. So if you look at, if you slow down a runner, a human runner, then there's, right. a, there's, a, there's an aerial phase. So T-Rex couldn't do that. Its bones could not withstand the stress of running. So it could only walk. But of course, its legs are very long, so it had a very long stride. So it could have moved or walked about, yeah, about the speed of like Usain Bolt, maybe a tiny bit faster. So it would still probably that's still pretty um, fast. Probably be faster than you, Harry. So my top tip is just make sure you're faster than the slowest person if you're being chased. <laughs> I'll run with you in the Cretaceous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, actually, you know, you might be faster than me. So I've got very short legs. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Uh, now, um, yeah, so with that, another question that comes to mind, actually, that might be your study. Actually, no, the one I watched, there was a little documentary and they did the similar kind of a cal calculation and they worked out because some people were suggesting, no, it could run 50 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour. And then they were saying, no, the, the muscles would have to be that big. And that just looked ridiculous on, on the T-Rex because obviously nature, you know, like nothing goes uh, over the top. But yeah. um, so the second part is, about its um, eating habits. Some people have suggested that, you know, it was just a, um, a scavenger or some people say it was actively a predator. What, what, do we, what do we know about that? Well, again, very difficult to test in a scientific way. Um, you know, what evidence do we have today without going back and watching? What evidence do we have and how do we get that evidence? It's very, very tricky. Um, but I think um, if you look at modern animals today, um, one thing's very clear, and that is that a, an animal on the savanna that is actively hunting does not just wander past the dead carcass and, you know, mm. be like picky about it. You know, if it's a meal, it's a meal. So if there's right. something that's dead and it's, and it's, and it's, it's fair game, then it's going to eat it. Um, so I think that there's this kind of false dichotomy between is it, is it a predator, is it a scavenger? Well, you know what? It's probably both. Probably did both and whatever, you know, wherever food it could get, it got it from there. So, um, yeah, I, one thing I don't think it was doing, I mean, I, I don't think there was any pursuit predation in the Mesozoic. So, so I don't think T-Rex was chasing after uh, hadrosaurs in the way that, you know, you might see a lion chasing an antelope across the, the savannah today. I mean, you know, they, nothing was running fast in the Mesozoic. So there was probably a little bit more kind of a surprise happening. Um, than chasing. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they would probably scavenge as much as predate, to be honest. It's still faster than us, I'd say. I mean, we would still end up the prime. Well, actually, we probably wouldn't be big enough to, we won't be that appetizing. It's like a little nibble. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and I, and I agree with that. And I, I was listening to another paleontologist a while ago, and they were saying, yeah, it's like modern lions do that too. People think that all oh, lion is so honorable and it always hunts its own meal. No, lions would take it from anyone and then if, if you just happen to be to you know just run into a t-rex straight in his jaws he'll grab you, you know? yeah, so that would be yeah. classified as a hunt or not um when it comes to t-rex last question on t-rex when it comes to t-rex people are always fascinate about in the early movies we used to actually see you know big theropod dinosaur like t-rex with um Fire, fighting with the Brachiosaurus or something, a sauropod, and then people at the end said, you know, they never lived together. But now you're telling me that some actually did migrate up in the late Cretaceous era, so they might have run into them as well. But 
um, for the last 20 years or so, maybe the, the Jurassic Park era movies, we've led to believe that, okay, T-Rex versus a Triceratops. How likely would that have been? Because Triceratops, they, they fool you sometimes because, you know, they're much shorter. They're not as tall as T-Rex, but it's like a tank and it's almost as heavy as a T-Rex. Yeah, and Triceratops and T-Rex did live at the same time in the same place. So um, no doubt they, they did come across each other. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think um, that some of these, you know, these sort of weird structures that these dinosaurs have. So obviously Triceratops has this big frill and all these horns. Um, and, you know, other, other dinosaurs that lived at other times as well. So things like Stegosaurus with its plates and spikes. Um, Ankylosaurus, which did live at the same time as T-Rex, big tail club. I think that um, these sorts of structures were probably because these dinosaurs couldn't run away. They had to come mm. up with kind of alternative, either defensive structures that stopped them getting eaten or structures that made them look more scary than they were, you know, either by making them look bigger um, or, you know, um, who knows, maybe Triceratops could have flushed its, its frill, different colors or something, um, made it look scary. We, I don't know, but I suspect that's what all these weird structures, you know, evolution doesn't let you make um, these weird metabolically expensive frills and horns just, you know, for no reason. Um, so I, I think that maybe that might be that might be the reason that, you know, that they, they couldn't run away. So they had to come up with other defensive strategies. Well, and, and as you said, I mean, um, they, they obviously live together, but we also see the fossil record of Protoceratops, and then you know they're evolving over a certain million million of years, and then we also see T. Rex's evolution. All this, there's a whole family of Tyrannosaurus, mm -hmm. and they started very small, and then kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, the other come some big successful ones are favorite ones are Albert. I, I know that's American uh, North American bias in there. Albertosaurus, and what's the other one? There's, there's um, well, I think there are quite a few. Uh, the, <laughs> Yeah, so with what, what I don't understand, there's one big dinosaur that had a massive claw, and they thought that that must have been a predator, but it actually turned out to be a herbivorous. Yeah. Uh, what, what was that called? So with, these with are the big dinosaurs. Um, so so, yeah, were, that, uh, those were, I wish you could actually come up with easier names. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that one wasn't actually Just my name. I'm going <laughs> to... Tazinosaurus or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I remember that one. So that's the only one. It's like a pterapod. But how do we go into like, did we go into very early on, like some dinosaur decided, okay, we're going to be meat eaters and we're going to be pteropods, whereas all the other ones were like um, four-legged creatures and they all turned out to be her herbivorous. Well, uh, the, the four legs and the herbivory is, is possibly linked. Um, the All dinosaurs started off, uh, as two-legged animals. So the first dinosaurs were two-legged and then we have two, two lineages. Um, and those lineages are called the lizard hip dinosaurs and the bird hip dinosaurs. And the lizard hip dinosaurs go on to be the theropods, the meat eaters, and the sauropods, the long neck, long tailed dinosaurs. And then the bird hip dinosaurs go on to be the, um, the things like Triceratops and Stegosaurus oh. and Iguanodon and, and all of those kind of herbivores. Um, and so the sauropods, the long neck, long tail dinosaurs, and the bird hip dinosaurs evolved four-leggedness and herbivory, the ability to eat plants, independently of each other. Um, and they stay herbivorous. So we don't see any meat eaters evolving within the bird hip dinosaurs or the sauropods. But the meat eating dinosaurs, probably the first dinosaurs were probably meat eating. The meat-eating dinosaurs, they stay meat-eating, but then just one group of them, one or maybe two groups of them, actually, because we've got the ornithomimosaurs as well, which I think there's some debate yeah. around their feeding. Um, they then evolve herbivory as well. So um, we see herbivory evolving multiple times in the dinosaur fossil record. But once that you get to be a herbivore, it doesn't seem that you change back to being a carnivore. Um, now, they may have become four-legged because herb plants are actually quite hard to digest. Um, if you think about kind of some big mammalian herbivores today, they have these big kind of barrel-like stomachs. Um, and it's possible that they, they, they went down onto four legs to kind of allow them to get a very long barrel-like gut and support that um, with their four legs. Um, but again, it's very, very difficult. I actually spent three years studying why these dinosaurs might have become four-legged, and I don't even have a good explanation for you. So it is a difficult one. Right, right. Um... The other one was Allosaurus. I was going to uh, ask yeah, about those. Okay. So, 
Okay, so which one now? Obviously, all these dinosaurs before uh, that are predating, um, not oh, actually pre predating, not predating, mm -hmm. um, like Allosaurus, uh, Carcharodontosaurus, and all these other ones. Actually, there was one massive one, Spinosaurus. Have Have you guys worked out what what was it like? I mean, recently, I think only a year ago, they said that it actually used to walk like a crocodile or something. What do we yeah. do? We know what's happening. Yeah, there's, so um, Spinosaurus is very enigmatic. Um, it's found in a load of um, rocks where we also find lots of crocs and lots of fish and sharks and things like that. So it's, it, it's clearly a kind of fluvial environment, a river environment, um, or a delta, like shallow marine, something like that. And the um, very recently, in the last year, as you say, um, some scientists excavated a tail, which was the first tail that they'd known. And the tail turns out to, it's very, very deep and paddle-like. Um, it actually, to me, it really looks like a newt's tail. Um, yeah. And they have argued that this and some other evidence look, looking at it, the proportions of its limbs and also the density of its limbs suggested that it was actually an aquatic dinosaur. And I think this is quite compelling. I think their evidence is quite compelling. Now, for some reason that I don't really understand, and this is mainly among paleontologists who work on meat eating dinosaurs, which I don't, they hate this idea. And they, they get all well, upset it about it, upset of it, and they shout about it on social media. And I don't really know why, because we have dinosaurs, we have burrowing dinosaurs, we have dinosaurs that lived up trees. You know, why don't why couldn't we have a dinosaur that had a kind of crocodile-like habit and lived in rivers? I, I don't understand what the problem with that is. It makes perfect sense. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think their evidence is, is rather compelling, um, but it is debated. Well, it's because we want a big tyrant lizard, you know, like the, the one just fast that just scares us, and like you know, then we can have a good fight between a T Rex and a um, and a Spinosaurus. Um, you, now, um, British dinosaur Baryonyx, I believe, is the biggest one that we found. Doesn't that belong with? Because I know with Spinosaurus, I mean, the fossils could not be found, and then. Hitler decided to bomb them or something. Um, and that's why we, we couldn't really develop a good idea. But Baryonyx, to say, belongs to the, is probably the early ancestor of Spinosaurus. Can't we tell by looking at Baryonyx's um, body or fossils that what it was? Absolutely. So Baryonyx is a Spinosaur as well. You're right. And um, it comes from the lower Cretaceous of the UK. Um, it's actually, I think it's the second most complete meat-eating dinosaur ever found in Europe. So very complete skeleton. Um, lovely skull. Um, it's actually in the collection that I look after in the Natural History Museum. So it's a very cool right. dinosaur, close to my heart. And it, um, yeah, it has a very elongated snout. It, it, it has a, almost a rosette shape at the end, a bit like a gharial does today. Um, its nostrils are set high up on the top of its head. It's very, very, it's got a very crocodilian like um, face. And so the researchers who originally described it back in the early, 90, uh, early 80s suggested that it might well have been eating fish and it has a number of adaptations that suggest that it was a fish eating dinosaur um, and actually they also found its stomach contents part of its stomach contents and in that stomach contents there was a baby iguanodon but there was also um, some fish scales so it does look like um, part of baronic diet uh -huh. at least was fish um, and it has this enormous claw and baryonyx means heavy claws huge huge claw on it on its forelimb and and that has been interpreted as kind of like a, a device for hooking fish out of out of streams a bit like a, a brown bear might do um in alaska today if you can imagine that so um yeah i you know i think there is evidence that the spinosaurus as a group were were piscivorous were eating fish um and maybe spinosaurus took this to the ultimate kind of limit and and became a sort of almost fully aquatic dinosaur Right. Okay. I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to ask you some quick fire questions. Actually, no, before I go that, um, so tell me a little bit about future of paleontology. I know in Australia, we haven't found as many di dinosaur fossils. Um, somebody, I read it somewhere, I could be wrong, that is probably, you know, we're not at the right scale of erosion or something. I don't know how that works, because that also matters. Like, I mean, it could be like 100 meters below, you know, like yeah. that also matters where you are. And North America and China are in the perfect position right now in this part of our uh, history. And Europe also has developed and as, uh, you know, as much as in Western sciences is still lagging behind. And we now, after um, North America, now we're seeing huge number of discoveries in China. What, what's with Europe and Australia? What, what, what's going on? Okay, well, there's two different stories there. Australia, as I said earlier, part of the continent of Australia is incredibly ancient. 
And Australia has been a continental area for like, well, ever, literally. And um, this means that the kind of the rock has kind of piled on top of it, but it hasn't been involved in too many collisions with other continents. So the, the rocks haven't been bent up a lot. They're kind of flat lying for a lot of the, a lot of it. There's a bit, there's a bit, um, but some of those are bit, the, 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 where it has been bent up, we're seeing cores of very, very old rocks. So this means that when we, if we want to get down to the rocks of the right age, because obviously to find dinosaurs, we have to be looking at rocks that are from the Mesozoic period. Um, you, you can find them and, and there's some around the coast in Victoria, for example, um, but it, they tend to be just weathering out on the coast and on the cliffs. And that means that um, it's difficult to, to find the fossils. And sometimes farmers have um, plowed up fossils um, in Australia as well. Um, but yeah, you're right that the, a lot of the, the ground level isn't, the rocks of the right, the right age just aren't, aren't there. Um, right. and, and there's not much we can do about that except wait for a few more million years until erosion gets gets there. Um, <laughs> in Europe, I mean, actually in Europe, to be fair, um, you know, the first dinosaurs were found in Europe. The word dinosauria was invented um, by Sir Richard Owen, who was the founder of the Natural History Museum. Um, so dinosaurs have a long, long history of discovery um, in Europe um, and, and in the UK, but also um, across the rest of Europe. And we do have a lot of, uh, of fossils. We do have rocks of the right age. The ones that I'm sat on right here in my house and below me are actually the rocks where the first dinosaurs were found. But right. um, what we have here is the wrong climate. So we have um, a lot of trees. Um, we have a lot of greenery. We have a lot of houses. Um, and, and this means that the rocks aren't exposed at the surface. So we've got the right age rocks, but they're all covered in soil and trees and stuff like that. So we also have to rely on going to the coasts, and um, particularly where I live here in Sussex, and we have to go to the coast and have a look um, to find our dinosaurs here. Um, but um, actually, you know, throughout Europe, there, there, there's a lot of dinosaurs that, that, that are known. So we don't suffer quite from the sampling issues that Australia does. And with, so now uh, with America and China, it's just because they're just the right place at the right time. And uh, what Badlands of Montana, they say there's anyone yeah. who walks in, you can just find some old dinosaur bone. Exactly. So much of the West of America, um, you know, the, 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 as in the cowboy West, um, is uh, is a desert. So, yeah, there's not much vegetation there. And also there's hardly any people there, at least compared to the UK. Maybe not compared right. to parts of Australia, but, you know, there are hardly any people there. So um, that means that there's not a lot of trees, there's not a lot of houses um, or, or indeed anything. Um, so, yeah, there's there's lots of opportunity. There's lots of exposure of rock. You can see the rock at the surface of the earth and, and that's perfect for finding fossils. Um, with China, it's a massive country, obviously different climatic zones. Um, some of their um, very, very famous recent discoveries have been made in quarries. And we've got lots of quarrying going on. Um, but also a lot of there's been a lot of dinosaurs from places like um, Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. Um, and yeah. of course, no trees, no trees and houses there either. So, yeah. Right. OK, quick fire questions. Who would win a fight between Giganotosaurus and T-Rex? I have absolutely no idea. Let's go T-Rex. Is, is no, but I, I've heard some theories because people say Giganotosaurus was, it, it wasn't as thickly built as T-Rex. Like the jaw was not as, it, it looked a bit brittle. And T-Rex's teeth are like much more, you know, like stronger and sturdier. Uh, does that look like it is the strongest dinosaur maybe ever? I don't know. Just come on, just say yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I don't know whether it's untestable, and that's I'm unwilling to comment as a scientist. Yeah, but we, yeah, but one day we might be able to find Jurassic Park. How, how, can Jurassic Park really actually happen? Can we find old blood? Um, uh, at the moment, um, so we have found dinosaur blood, um, but it is decayed, so we don't have. Um, it's not in its in its kind of dinosaur blood state. It's it's just the the, the remnants of the proteins um, that are in the blood. Um, we've also found other soft tissues, um, but as of now, there is no DNA. So um, the oldest DNA in the fossil record is about one million years old. So no oh. Jurassic Park can't, can't happen right now, which is good, I think, because we saw that film, right? You know what happened. Yeah, that but fun. that was so cool. No, yeah. that was so cool. I mean, just, yeah, no, I reckon I can manage it better. But um, <laughs> With 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 the um okay we got six minutes okay let, let's just, let's just take one caller Darwin what would you like to say just one quick question please um my my only que question is uh, the fossil uh, proof is it only 
in Australia or Canada or Europe or in the Middle East also. Okay, all I mean, right. Thank you for asking. the world or just okay, uh, all right. Some particular areas. Okay, so I guess this question is basically we kind of answered that that we've had we've seen fossils in America and China and Europe, some in Australia, but it's probably interested to know have you found some really dinosaur cool dinosaurs in middle east because there's a lot of desert there and in india and uh, asia some other popular yeah actually we found dinosaurs on every continent dinosaurs are known on every continent including antarctica um Ooh. so dinosaurs live all over the world now actually off the top of my head i don't know that we found a dinosaur in the middle east that there's probably lots of reasons for that it could be that the rocks the outcrop at the surface are are the wrong age. I'm, do you know what? I feel bad, but I'm not totally um, familiar with the geology um, of the Middle East so well. Um, it could be that the rocks at, at the surface aren't quite the right age. Um, it could be that there's not very good exposure um, of those rocks. Um, but but it's certain that there will there will be dinosaurs there if the rocks are the right age of that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Next question from Mr. Potato Chips. Hey, young fellow. What question do you have? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You're on mute. Um, hi. Okay. Yes, hi. What would you like to ask? Are the, dinos are the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park actually like... Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, we can hear you. Keep going. Uh, so are the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park actually accurate? Like... That's a great question, what? and I could actually, okay. I could, go on, I could actually yeah, go do for a it. whole yeah. show. I could do a whole, a whole hour telling you about whether or not the dinosaurs are accurate. Um, the answer is yes and no. Some of them are really accurate. The one that is the most inaccurate, I think, is the velociraptors from Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. Because Forgot to ask you about know, that. Yeah, we now know that they were all covered in feathers. Um, so rather than being kind of scaly reptilian, they would have been all feathered dinosaurs. And so they're not very accurate, but lots of the others are. Um, so um, many of the other dinosaurs, the long-necked dinosaurs, much more accurate, yeah. But they also messed up that they call it Velociraptor. The Velociraptors are actually really small. It's meant to be a Utah Raptor, and, but yeah, then Utah they just Raptor, went with it. Well, Utah Raptor hadn't been discovered when Jurassic Park um, was, was made. First but, one. Um, Deinonychus is another, another dinosaur that was, was similar, that was around about the same. Um, but I heard that the reason they didn't call it Deinonychus in Jurassic Park was because they were worried the cast wouldn't be able to pronounce the word. I don't know whether that's true, but that's what they say. What was the, what was the new one that in, in the new one that they um, there was actually scenes? She said you should try listen to uh, you should try kids pronounce blah 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 blah. And he's like you he should you should try listen yourself. <laughs> um, now with T Rex, did they have feathers or not? Because that's just like one ugly dinosaur. If it had T Rex, I mean if yeah. it had feathers. There's no evidence at this point that T-Rex had feathers. Um, there's some um, early Tyrannosaurids, so some um, kind of cousins of T-Rex that, that that seem to be kind of fluffy, um, but we haven't found any evidence that T-Rex itself was feathered. Right. Okay. Now, since you're a young fellow, and I hope you, you if you are interested in dinosaurs, and I hope um, you might want to end up becoming paleontologist. Do you have one more question? Do you have any other question or remark? No, no. no thank okay. You. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, all right, so that was what we did just on the dot with the T Rex being on um, or having feathers. And the one interesting story in the last couple of minutes um, what was the first dinosaur they called it? Archaeopteryx or something? The first that, uh, yeah, so they now that's one very interesting fact because when I was in school, I remember telling uh, my biology teacher that, oh. The, I watched a Discovery Channel documentary and they said dinosaurs had feathers. And he was like, reptiles having feathers? <laughs> Get out of here. Now, this is obviously in the, in the 90s. And how did that change? Because I've seen the fossil that they actually had feathers, Archaeopteryx or something. And then we say the lineage of birds went from there. And um, how cool is that fact that, you know, dinosaurs are alive in birds? Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, we, people say, oh, well, the dinosaurs are extinct. But actually... The dinosaurs today are the most species terrestrial vertebrates with over 10,000 living species. Because every time you look out your window um, and see it, see a bird, you are looking at a dinosaur. Um, so I think that's probably the coolest fact, yeah. 
Right, and we'll end we'll end on that note, guys. Thank you very much, Susie, for coming in and telling you. And the only sad part, with the dinosaurs are still alive, but all the cool ones are gone. But anyway, <laughs> thanks. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I'll um, be back next week with a physicist, Dr. Ben um, next Ben Davis, and we'll be talking about the stars next time. Until then, science office. <laughs>